How do we recover from trauma? How is someone supposed to recover and heal from damaging childhood experiences or the weight of bad habits of self-hatred? Are you supposed to just tough it out until you feel better? Seek counseling to let someone else help you put your issues into perspective? Push it down and try to never deal with it again? I, for one, understand the impulse to feel that you should be strong enough to solve your issues by yourself. The feeling that asking for help means admitting you're weak. Holding on to that self-loathing can even feel good. I deserve to feel this way. It's natural to punish myself when I fail. I should be strong enough to deal with these problems on my own. Of course things never work out in my career, relationships, life. I'm a bad person who doesn't deserve good things. Whether or not these thoughts and feelings are any that you yourself might be familiar with, and generalizing when it comes to an individual's experience should be avoided when dealing with these subjects, the struggle to exist in some kind of harmony with the world around you can be difficult, even in the best of circumstances. Perhaps a question that's more pertinent to the game we're looking at today is, how can you be expected to effectively give help, guidance, and comfort to others when you're feeling far from stable yourself? Most important of all, what happens when all these struggling people, balanced on the knife's edge, are given a good, hard push? This is In Sound Mind. Now, I do enjoy the occasional horror game. I've played several Fatal Frames. Fatal Frame 2 is easily the scariest game I've ever personally beaten, and that was in a dark room with friends, so the ghost had someone else to kill while I could dive out a window. I hold Resident Evil 4 up in my all-time greats, and I've had a lot of fun with the Dead Space and Left 4 Dead series over the years. Anything truly frightening, however, I tend to admire from afar, and I've heard so many tales of bargain bin steam shovelware that unless something truly distinguishes itself, it's rare for me to even get to that point of distant admiration. What happened? In Sound Mind is not a game I would have likely stumbled on by myself. Playing as a therapist who must delve into the trauma of past patients who have died and then seemingly turned into monsters that reflect their deepest fears in the darkest parts of their psyches is not typically a pitch that would have caught my interest. I was fortunate then that I had a chance connection with the lead writer of In Sound Mind, Yair Bendor, who I met through his work on the excellent stage play Prayer for the French Republic at the Manhattan Theatre Club. We discovered that we were both gamers, and he recommended his game to me, and I was only too happy to dive in. How could I resist when one of the main architects was right there to give me further insight once I'd finished my playthrough? My interview with him yielded a treasure trove of insights into the development and thought processes that went into the making of the game, and there's a link to the entire interview down in this video's description. My thanks to Yair for sharing his insights and enthusiasm about his project. I think you'll be able to see from the interview how much thought and passion was clearly involved in the making of this game. In spite of that passion, going back to my first few moments with the game, it was not immediately apparent that In Sound Mind held much in store beyond many of those slapped together, made in two weeks, barely game efforts that litter many digital storefronts like leftover chicken feed. For starters, the game doesn't always run smoothly, which is a shame considering the graphics are decent, but nowhere near the heights of AAA realism. I admit my current GPU isn't top of the line, but it's usually capable of handling most of what's thrown its way. There was a patch issued as of May 2022 that improved my performance a decent amount, but I think there's still some work that could be done here. There's also a lot of horror game cliches that come at you in a hurry. You're in a dark room with no memory of how you got there, and not much besides a flashlight to help you find your way, and some vague messages that imply, rather than outright state, a threat. A figure watching you from the shadows, a phone call with a threatening voice on the other side. There he is. Long have I waited for this moment, to watch as you scramble for your last breath, as you try to make sense of your reality and the gravity it carries. Pulling you down. <laughs> Ooh, I can't contain my excitement. <laughs> I will have you, Desmond Wales. I will have all of you. 
The first truly arresting image is your view of the city outside, flooded and lit by a starlit sky and the title card. The early rooms you explore are all pretty nondescript as well, dank basement areas with a sense of nondescriptness that doesn't really leave you with a strong sense of place. There's a few easy puzzles to solve to ease you into some of what the game will expect from you, and your first encounter with one of the game's primary enemy types, a lumbering creature of ink and smoke that's used to tutorialize your ability to sneak. I occasionally had trouble using stealth effectively against these ink blots, more so than the primary monsters of each level, and the fact that I'm still not sure if it was just me not doing stealth well, or if it was that I didn't have a great grasp of how the game's stealth systems worked for them, is a shame. While narratively fitting, these monsters are notable to me mostly for the fact that they seem to be sent after you by the voice on the phone, and the piercing lights that emit from their eyes, a kind of walking security cam with a hellish nightmare filter on its lens. What those early moments boiled down to for me was that it seemed like the game was expecting me to care about the mysteries it was setting up without yet giving me a solid reason to do so. Now, this would change later on, once I had a firmer grasp on what it was the game was actually going to be about, and a greater sense of its scope and ambition. I truly came to appreciate what InSound Mind was setting out to accomplish, but it's unfortunate that the game's first impressions didn't match up with what was to come. Looking back, there are a few things that hinted that there was more going on here. The attention to detail on the heavy plastic switch of the flashlight was very much like the ones I remember from the era the game is set in, the 90s. The note that you find directing you to assemble the components of a pistol is from a character who is actually quite important, even if it won't be apparent until so far into the game that it's likely you'll have forgotten the note long ago. There are quite a few of these seeds that are planted early on. The art and level design have several other hints that things will start to become much more distinct and appealing. In fact, once you look back out at the city near the end of the game, there are several landmarks that you'll recognize, but that's getting ahead of ourselves for now. What's important is that the game is holding a lot of its cards close to its chest, but they will be revealed in due time. Most important of all, there is a cat, and yes, you can pet it. Good kitty. There are also a few clues that the game isn't going to take itself quite as seriously as some other horror games. The first real clue is the names of the pills you can find that serve as your source of character growth over the rest of the game. These are all completely optional, but finding them will permanently increase your health, stamina, stealth, and speed. The stealth pill is called Detectinol. The speed pill is Fastenide. Get it? Also, eating food to restore your health is an old video game staple, but how many player characters occasionally say nom out loud while chowing down? Nom. Clearly, Desmond's personality is on the dorkier side of the scale. Yair and I discussed this insistence on humor, and he actually had to ask Desmond's voice actor to nerd things up a bit, since the actor was so much cooler than Desmond was as written. Finally, many of the room numbers, while not making sense from an architectural perspective, are clearly references to other famous room numbers from books and films. You can't go into any of them, but I did notice and appreciate their inclusion. Probably the most consistent clue is the constant messages, phone calls, and appearances from the yellow trench coat wearing boogeyman with the melted face. While he looks like the man with the yellow hat from Curious George after a dunk in an ace chemical vat, he's got a showman's flair for the dramatic. His voice will be a constant presence throughout the experience, and as fond as he is of threatening you with a grisly death or taunting you with your supposed failures, he's also incredibly fond of corny jokes and wordplay. Now, I won't spoil his true identity and motives until later on, so to keep all that shrouded, I'll be calling him whatever bad pun, silly name, or Captain Planet villain I can think of for the rest of the video. Lastly, I want to shout out the game's composer, The Living Tombstone. They knew the lore of the entire game before working on its soundtrack, and I think it's a real highlight. Yair had nothing but praise for them, and I'll go into some more specifics about their contributions later on in the video. 
To complete the lead into the game proper, you find a few doorways that act as portals to disconnected living spaces, and with some exploration, find cassette tapes inside. One is yours, and one belongs to one of your former patients, Virginia. Desmond's office is located on the top floor of the building you woke up in, and there is in fact a tape player inside, likely for use during sessions. Playing your tape shakes the building and turns your door into another portal, one that takes you to a dark realm, a place of rocks and shoals and a giant cassette tape off in the distance that actually spools when you listen to audio logs that are scattered ahead on the path. This is your first concrete exposition dump of the game. You get some hints as to Virginia's personality as you explore her room for her cassette, but it's not until diving into her tape that you actually get a chance to understand her and what she was going through. And this is where In Sound Mind truly begins. Next tape. We've gotten a hint of this kind of place before. Another transition zone of sorts, another liminal in-between space, all murky water, jagged rocks, and abandoned shopping carts. This is what a parking lot would look like after the flood, when the monsters had moved in and finished redecorating. There are some lights to guide your way, a few tape recorders containing moments from some of your therapy sessions with Virginia. The looming cassette tape motif continues here as well. It's one of my favorite visuals in the early game. Once you clear some basic jumping puzzles, it's on to the store itself and your first in-person encounter with one of your patients. Homemart looks from the inside like it could have been any number of retail giants that would open a franchise in any town USA. This one has already explicitly caused a few of the local mainstays to close down in this town, Milton Haven, which just adds to that lovely convenience at a cost feeling so many big box stores can bring. There's a few things off about this one though, starting with the obvious, it's deserted. It's dark. There's police tape everywhere. Am I really alone? The security cameras seem almost actively hostile. There's a lot of broken glass on the floor. And, and why is that mirror standing so obviously, ominously, in the middle of an aisle? Here, we meet Virginia. Or rather, what's left of her. In many ways, the mechanics and appearance of the Watcher are a bit of sleight of hand. Her ghostly appearance and the way she floats around and hunts you through the store are akin to many other horror games of this type, and while the rest of the patients you encounter all attempt to track you down in similar ways, their designs and mechanics are all unique and surprising in ways that belie the apparent simplicity of Virginia, while still being very much in line with her design. This apparition slowly floats around the aisles, attracted to any noise you might make or any sounds she might hear, and if she does find you, she hurls herself in your direction with howling ferocity. It's quickly apparent that the only thing that keeps the spirit at bay is to force her to see herself, either in one of the large mirrors that are scattered around the store, or the shard of the first one that she breaks, which becomes a new tool for you to utilize over the rest of the game. This mirror piece ends up serving many different aspects of the game. As a way to drive off the Watcher, it fits because she can't stand to see herself in the mirror. As a practical tool, it's perfect for cutting through barriers that were holding you back. Police tape, blocked doors, air vent covers. The shard becomes your Swiss army knife. It also serves as the game's ingenious hint system. Hold the mirror up to look behind you, and you can see writing on the walls, floors, and ceiling that help to emphasize the thoughts and feelings of your former patients. And it also lights up any object of interest, and that highlighting will float hazily in the air for several seconds, even once you've put the mirror down. For a completionist, this mechanic's inclusion is a godsend. Returning to the haunted corridors of the Home Mart, the game lets you know that your main objective will be getting the Watcher to shatter all of the mirrors that are hidden around the store. The first one is a freebie, and is what gives you the valuable shard. The second one is only a few aisles away, and serves as a good reinforcement for how to coax her toward you without incurring her wrath too early, or else a good way to drive home that she can be scared away by your fragment. 
There are a lot of tricky little impediments to remaining unseen here. The store cameras are very much not on your side, and one of the unfortunate side effects of all that broken glass on the ground is very crunchy, audible footsteps. Attempt to move through the store with too much haste or carelessness, and you'll quickly find the watcher's gaze landing on you. Once you've gotten her to shatter the second broken mirror, you find a key that lets you advance further into the store. Here's where my favorite horror trope subversion enters the game. We're in an abandoned department store, which means they probably have a clothing section somewhere. So that can really mean only one thing, spooky mannequins, except these are wearing name tags. They move when you're not looking, leaping about when your back is turned like weeping angels, sometimes showing up right behind you, except this one is handing you the keys to a locker. And that one is pointing to a helpful spot where I can climb the vents and giving me a boost. I want to thank Dave, Inez, Samantha, and the rest for really going above and beyond with their customer service. This skewering of the typical implementation of scary mannequins is just one of the many ways that In Sound Mind works to play with your expectations of what to expect in a horror game. This first level with the Watcher could have very easily just been about being chased by her from section to section, trying to find each mirror for her to smash. This is far from the case, and when I spoke to Yair, this sense of subversion was clearly one that the team had been very careful about cultivating. The further you progressed into the game, and the more times common tropes were set up and then defied, meant that the times that they're played straight would be that much more effective. The one thing that quickly became apparent is that even though the basic goals of each new level would follow the same similar patterns, when it came to the many smaller and larger details inside of those levels, expect the unexpected. Reinforcing this notion is that when you gain access to the side halls of the mall, the loading dock and the employee areas, Virginia doesn't pursue you. Here you get to solve some puzzles and get some small glimpses into the incident that occurred here, as well as learn a few tidbits about the store's employees. None of this information is all that deep or complex, but each piece of information about Virginia begins to grow your knowledge about what actually happened to her, and the small glimpses into the everyday gripes of the store's workers helps to ground this haunted box store as somewhere almost real. You're not completely safe back here, though. There are some inkblot monsters, and the man in the yellow coat is still dogging your every step. As I mentioned before, the phone calls you've been getting from him are clearly the work of someone who's enjoying the chance to taunt and threaten you, and his blink-and-you'll-miss-them appearances have certainly added to the sense that he's always watching you. I have to add my own personal thanks that when the devs finally have him pull a full Pazuzu on you, it doesn't have an accompanying scare cord. I'll talk a bit later about the ways that I think In Sound Mind does and doesn't fully lean into being a true horror game, but in this case, I was glad at least that they pulled a punch a bit. Regardless, it's pretty clear that Mr. Meltyface is going to be sticking around for the foreseeable future. He wants you dead, but clearly on his terms. The rest of this level is all about figuring out ways to gain access to each of the other sections of the store, where you hope to locate the rest of the Watcher's mirrors and have her break them. The two real standouts for me are the electronics section, where you have to align televisions to stare at your pursuer, and a freezer that the man with no name, who is also a jerk, locks you into, and you're only saved by the timely intervention of another friendly mannequin. The maze-like storage room where you must deal with several patrolling ink blots is probably the scariest implementation of them here by a good margin. To reach the final mirror, there are several dolls to locate around the store that you must place into a dollhouse based on a poem left by Virginia. By the time you've gathered the whole family and made it to the toy section where you get the watcher to smash the final mirror, you'll have learned that Virginia had bad scars on her face from an accident when she was a child from getting hit with a falling bathroom mirror. She had attended beauty pageants before the accident, and when her mother insisted on her still attending, and compounded by other factors, Virginia had developed high levels of anxiety and a desperate need to self-isolate. Even breaking routine could be traumatic for her, which is what having to come to the Homa Mart instead of her old, now-closed grocery store was to her. Desmond had encouraged Virginia to push her, her boundaries, and the result of this boundary pushing was her breaking a mirror, stabbing herself, and then opening her throat. 
The yellow shade that's hounding Desmond continually berates him gleefully for failing to treat her successfully, laying the blame for her death squarely at Desmond's feet. Is there some truth to this? Desmond seems to think otherwise. Right now, at this point in the game, I'm not sure who to believe, but this is clearly just the first piece in a puzzle that's starting to seem quite a bit larger than it looked when we first took it out of the box. It's okay. I see you. You can rest now. Thank you. Leaving the home of Mart, we get some final audio logs of a very important session Desmond had with Virginia. It's from the first time she opens up about her scars to him, and these audio logs do a good job of building some further context for Virginia's mindset and creating some solid sympathy for her and the pain that was so clearly always close to overwhelming her. With Virginia's spirit laid to rest, it's time to forge ahead and see what else is in store for Desmond and for us. This second level is where In Sound Mind truly begins to show off the depth that it was hinting at. Its slow build of the apartment complex and the home of art leading to a true opening of possibilities. Returning to your office, you're greeted by your first real ally, the cat I mentioned earlier, whose name is Tanya. Desmond already seems to know her from his waking life, and the fact that there's a talking cat in his office doesn't seem all that out of place with all the other things he's currently dealing with. She confirms that the path he's on is the correct one, that he has to get to the bottom of all this madness in order to survive. With mirror shard in hand, there's now much more of the building that opens up to you. Being able to cut through the amazingly resilient police tape that's strung up everywhere gives you egress to nearly the entirety of every floor, and there's even an amazing view of Milton Haven from the roof. The way that the hotel begins to open up to you is the closest the game comes to venturing into Metroidvania territory, and while the path from patient to patient precludes the use of that structure in the tape levels, I'm glad that the hotel becomes a more familiar base of sorts, even if you are still at risk from ink blots. The most important room opened by the mirror shard is the door to your next patient's house, this one belonging to Alan Shore, a lighthouse keeper. After a few more words of encouragement from Tony the Cat, it's now time to get to the bottom of another patient's pain. Is there a link between Virginia and Alan? I wouldn't rule it out. I guess I'm about to find out. Be careful, Desmond. Next tape. Come back alive, please. The transition from your office into the tape is similar in that you're put into another liminal space to navigate, with several audio clips of Alan Shore's therapy sessions to prime you for the struggle to come. As a side note, I found it ironic that this is the third game in a row I've covered that's prominently featured whale skeletons at various points of their levels. Coming out the door on the far side of the transition puts you on a beach, and here is where In Sound Mind puts up my favorite intro to a patient in the game. Watching the cliff tops, where trees are getting uprooted and thrashed around, lends a mounting sense that this time you are really out of your depths. Moving down the beach, where the water is really quite a bit lower than it should be. A small shack with a shining light inside. Carrying this light will become the main objective of the level, it seems. And then... I love this subversion of the safety that is usually implied with a lighthouse. Instead of a guiding light, you get your own personal Eye of Sauron. As you get used to dodging the sweeping malevolence of the lighthouse, whose dull roar can be heard even in places where Desmond himself is safe from its reach, you also need to work your way towards it. Wrecked, smoldering cars, ink blots, and more casually tossed trees help to build anticipation as you reach the base of the hill. This forested, blighted area really brought to mind the deserted highways of Half-Life 2, although the change in threat from extraterrestrial to supernatural certainly adds a different flavor to the overall tone. 
Dropping into the courtyard of the lighthouse, we finally come face to face with the shade. Alan Shore is now a bubbling, caustic, consuming pool of darkness, and he hurls himself at you, pulling down cars, trees, and almost anything else in his path. Your mirror shard, which was enough to keep Virginia at bay, is no use here. But there are some conspicuous areas flooded with light that he seems unwilling to touch. I like how this is the second ironic defensive option given to you in the game. Virginia couldn't stand to be looked at, so force her to confront her own visage. Alan is a lighthouse keeper, so keep him at bay with overwhelming light. I like how the shade is more complex in its mechanics than just a monster that throws itself at you. It does come after you relentlessly until you're safe within a light source, it's true, but the fact that it can swallow up various parts of the environment forces you to engage with it in more nuanced and thoughtful ways than just run away until safe. There are several times throughout the level where the Shade's habit of consuming boxes, cars, and other objects are necessary for you to open up new pathways, both optional and mission critical. This usually means confronting the creature directly, waiting until the last second to move or juking around cover until the way ahead is clear. There is also much more of a delay in terms of when you receive an item that can drive Alan away. Yes, you use various light sources to scare him off, but unlike Virginia's mirror shard, which you receive right after you meet her, by the time you recover a flare gun from the bridge of a wrecked ship, which we'll talk more about shortly, the level is already over halfway done. Also, you can only hold so many flares, so while the mirror shard would never leave your possession, here you have to be much more judicious in how often you choose to send the shade running. The game does a good job of making sure that there's usually one nearby when a flare is truly needed, but the fact that they're not always handed to you for free was something I certainly appreciated. The flare also serves as an ongoing tool for Desmond moving forward, much like the mirror. As you explore the burnt-out ruins of Alan Shore's home, there are many sections that are blocked by sections of deep, almost solid darkness. There's some clever puzzle work here as you uncover oil that will let you light lamps to burn these sections away. The flare lets you do the same thing as long as you have ammo, and this deepening of your arsenal does a good job of adding threads to the narrative and gameplay that help to tie the tapestry of the game together as you progress through it. After you make it past your first few encounters with the Shade, and solve a pretty fun puzzle in a boathouse, Dick Tracy drops you down to the far too receded ocean for you to discover the first big piece of the puzzle of the bigger picture that's only been hinted at since the beginning. Throughout the game so far, there have been many barrels and boxes that leak an oily substance that's clearly not safe to ingest. A single bullet detonates these containers, and doing so is often the easiest way to take out inkblots, who rarely appear without some kind of container of the substance nearby. Down at the bottom of this far too drained area, the water that's here seems to be inundated with it. The air seems misty, infected with oily smoke, and the ugly veil is pierced by the tainted lights of inkblots, in numbers far greater than you faced before. Here, in this drained, rocky no-man's land, with giant whale skeletons and monsters crawling all over, you find a ship. The Thanatos is well-named, bearing the title of the Greek god of death. Not quite as on the nose as naming it Hypnos, perhaps, but it's still a fitting moniker. As you begin to work your way inside, the overwhelming presence of the mysterious substance is the likely cause of things starting to get truly strange. Not only does it start to feel like you're tumbling down the rabbit hole, you also get to experience the night that the lighthouse failed. Not just failed, but shut off at the worst possible moment, leaving this unscheduled, unlooked for ship no protection from the shoals on Milton Haven's coast. After experiencing the crash, you end up on the bridge, where you discover the flare gun. As you exit the ship, the game throws more creatures at you, and as your arsenal continues to grow, so too will the number of your foes. The ship is also the first time you hear a new voice, one whose presence will only be explained much later on. We'll call it the Angel for now. The ability to plant these seeds that pay off later is likely not just a credit to the planting of the devs. 
Since the game was originally slated to be open world, all the characters and backstories that Yair and the rest of the team developed, many of which we only get glimpses of or never see at all in the slimmed down final version, still help to flesh out the town and make the story feel bigger and far more complex than it might have otherwise. After revisiting the game after my discussion with Yair, I found myself fascinated by the newspapers and other documents that I kept finding in the areas I explored. How many of these people's names that kept recurring throughout the levels were slated to be fully-fledged characters in their own right? One person in particular who stands out is one of the Homomart employees who helps you out, and also contributes articles to a local rag. I really loved uncovering that detail that one of my mannequin allies had a life outside of the store. Yair teased me that he has all of the documents from the game in a folder, including unredacted versions of all the blacked out memos you find. While this final version of the game is obviously much different from the open world vision the team began with, it's clear the work that went into fleshing out the world found many good uses here. There are some big clues to the bigger picture in some of these pages around the beach Thanatos as well. Some evidence that there is, in fact, some kind of secretive government involvement with the whole affair. Remember, it's not being paranoid if they're actually out to get you. Leaving the drain depths behind and below you, it's time to once again face the shade. This wharf lets you take in some of the outer area before Alan finds you, and then comes a multi-area moving battle as you use the shade's consuming properties to open new areas in an attempt to get back to the lighthouse. The most notable moments here are your trip up a massive crank that Alan brings crashing down around you, and a tense chase through a maze of shelves inside the main warehouse. The flare gun will drive Alan off, but it's only ever a temporary respite. The shade pulls out all the stops as you fight your way back up the hill to the lighthouse. There's pools of darkness, debris raining down on you from above, and the baleful eye of the towering edifice is always ready to scorch you with its gaze. Getting inside and dispelling the darkness with a flare does lead to the relative tranquility of Alan's abode at the lighthouse's base. Here we get a few notes from Alan and a set of puzzles to unlock a door that feels right out of Silent Hill. Then comes the ascent to the top, and destroying the hellish lantern that's been forcing you to play duck and cover through most of the level. Simply destroying the light feels slightly anticlimactic to me after the singular impression it made in its first introduction, but from a narrative standpoint, I get how this manifestation of Alan's darkness needs to be taken out and replaced. There's also a complication in that just replacing the light is not enough, you have to head down to the basement to power it on, leading you to one last confrontation with the shade in incredibly cramped quarters. Succeed here, though, and you finally get to give Alan some peace. It's okay. The ship, the fire, those weren't your fault. Whatever this chemical is, it's got to be the source. Braver than you know. Alan's madness came on just as suddenly as Virginia's did. I have no doubt their cases are linked. I need to follow the chemical trail, see where it takes me. Heading back to Desmond's office, we now know some very important pieces of the puzzle. The crashed Thanatos was carrying some clearly dangerous cargo. It seems there is some government organization involved. Alan is badly burned in a coma at the hospital and may never recover. Something is clearly, as they say, up. In one of the recordings you hear from Alan, he mentions a guy named Nygaard had been around the crash site, as well as around you. And there was another document you found mentioning a driver for the big pharmaceutical company in town with the same name. I wonder who our next patient might be. I thought I went into the third tape with a pretty good idea of how the last few levels were going to play out. I got to explore a few more nooks and crannies of my building and find a few more upgrade pills. The flare gun would let me into the next patient's apartment. Playing the tape, there would be the liminal transition teasing my patient's personality, a small section of the level where I'd get some idea of what I was in for, and then a dramatic introduction of my patient's darker self and a subsequent chase before I found the means to keep them at bay and I could begin to learn more about the nature of events leading to my patient's breakdown. 
while I wasn't all that far off, I was still unprepared for the scope of the game to continue increasing, its ambitions outstripping my expectations as the story began to work towards its climax. If Virginia's issues were fear of rejection and self-loathing, and Alan's were depression and a morbid fascination with darkness, Max Nygaard's apartment and introductory space make it pretty clear that this man has anger issues. Recently separated from his wife and daughter, recently fired from his job driving for Meyer Pharmaceuticals, Max had problems that would be difficult to deal with even for a more even-keeled person. He wasn't even seeing Desmond because he was trying to get his rage issues under control. He was ordered to attend by the court. There's some hints at domestic violence as well, but in my playthroughs I never found any concrete evidence of it. Still, this is the least sympathetic patient by a long stretch. While the first two tapes were explicitly set at night, this third one seems like it's being lit from all sides by a distant forest fire, with ill-seeming orange smoke permeating the trees and buildings you explore. We're at a former quarry, the new location of a manufacturing plant for Meyer Pharmaceuticals, a name that's been dropped plenty of times by this point in the game. Back at your building, there was a chance before this level to pick up a shotgun, and I really hope you manage to take that chance, because in the train yard of the factory, he who sleeps in an acid bed sends a giant new form of ink blot at you, and the shotgun is an invaluable tool to take care of it, and the better armored melee and ranged varieties of ink blot you continue to encounter in aggressive groups. Work your way through the train yard surrounding the factory, and it'll be time to meet Max's darker form, the Bull. The entrance of the bull was my favorite reveal of a patient in the entire game. Nygaard's design was so much bigger and bolder than anything I had expected, yet so apropos for a man who was consumed by rage. This giant amalgamation of bone and steel, flames and choking exhaust was a fantastic representation for the man's darker impulses. Since the size of each level had grown with each new tape, the increased size and speed of the bull are enough to cover enough ground to keep you clearly unsafe whenever it's present. There's no cries of don't look at me or I just wanted to help from Nygaard. His lines are all pure aggression. The retreat back through the train yard now becomes a deadly game of cat and mouse, or bull and therapist, where you once again need to balance keeping your distance from your patient while using their powers, in this case the bull's great ramming strength, to help you progress. The first rest you have turns into a large platforming and ink blot combat segment before you can penetrate into the main area of the factory proper. Besides running from the bull, the other main mechanic exclusive to this level is the chips you collect to help you solve various electricity issues in your way. While before the occasional fuse was enough to help you, here at an actual plant with still working machines, these new items are familiar yet distinct. This is especially true with the addition of chips with different power levels, another wrinkle to help stretch your puzzle-minded brain even further. I thought this feature worked quite well with the aesthetics of the factory that you spend most of this level traversing, mixing the chips with detecting wiring with your mirror in a way that continues to make the first patient item you found the most versatile. These chips can be used in clever ways beyond opening doors as well, as insightful players can take advantage of a couple of opportunities to power on some transformers that will burn away any ink blot that steps near them. Acquiring this level's item takes much more effort than any of the others in the game. The lure pill, which can alternatively give you a boost to health and speed, burn away pools of the substance from the ship, one of my favorite effects in the game, the, the combination of angry red light and the sound of pressure building to an explosive climax really takes a lot of satisfaction boxes in my brain or attract and distract monsters when thrown, requires a specific mixture of toxic compounds that are scattered all over the factory. You can acquire them in mostly any order you like, which does a good job of matching the objective you're given to wander aimlessly. Two of the pill components are hidden behind multiple layers of platforming and puzzles, with both Sly Sludge and the Bull dogging your footsteps, including what I'm pretty sure is the largest single room puzzle in the game. 
This conveyor belt was a cool design, but the fact that the bull is so good at spotting you down here meant it could be tough to have the time you needed to figure out the correct path. This is one of the few places where a patient's presence borders on annoying rather than scary, which is a shame since the devs usually pace them out so thoughtfully. With a bit of extra digging, you can find and open a high security lab on the top floor that gives you a lot of really important pieces of the lore puzzle, including another encounter with the mysterious voice of the angel from the Thanatos, including an actual manifestation. We also finally get the name for the substance that seems to have wreaked such havoc with your patients and indeed the entire town of Milton Haven, Agent Rainbow. With callbacks to Agent Orange and references to secret historical government experiments, the unscheduled ship and documents confirming Meyer Pharmaceutical having offices not far from the White House, records of failed experiments and the unease of one of the researchers, Rosemary James, doubts about Desmond's culpability and his patient's breakdowns are well and truly brushed away. This is some Twin Peaks, Jacob's Ladder-style shenanigans the fictional Central Intelligence Bureau is getting up to, and if Desmond is to save himself, there's really no choice but to keep digging. Combining all of the pill ingredients involves a giant assembly room with pipes that seem like they were designed by a drunken engineer. It makes for an engaging one-off puzzle, and I'd much rather think of it as a converted quarry device than something designed to be solved, which I imagine was likely the intention. With the lure in hand, you can get the bull to crack open the door to the other part of the yard around the factory, and skilled aim with the pill can get Nygaard to take down any ink blots that roam around the area. The climax of the level takes place at the base of a mighty digging tool, likely a relic of the factory's former days as a quarry, where you work to drain a large pool and finally tame the beast. It seems, in the end, that Nygaard drove back to the plant to take his bosses to task for the loss of his job, while also sneaking in another of Desmond's patients to try and locate dirt on Asia Rainbow. Somehow, Max in his car ended up at the bottom of the pool with a letter to his daughter in his glove compartment. I think it's important that even though we get some humanizing characteristics for Max, especially in his love for his daughter, In Sound Mind doesn't fully redeem him. The issues he had were there before Agent Rainbow took hold of him, and while we don't get a good sense of how deeply the drug deepened his narcissism and sense of rage, he doesn't seem like the most pleasant cup of tea to be around before his exposure. It's okay. She will always be your daughter. You will always be her dad. In any event, we now have a much better idea of the shape of the forces we're struggling against. Still no apparent way to rescue Desmond from his current predicament, or how to deal with Tank Flusher III, but armed with greater knowledge, we head back to Desmond's office and his final patient. Dr. Wales, you there? Listen, the meeting went bad. They took her, man. I barely escaped. I don't know what they're gonna do. They're after me, and they might be coming after you too, just for seeing me. I'm sorry. It was strange to pick up the phone in Desmond's office and not have the speaker on the other end be Captain Pollution. This first connection to the outside world, or the real world, or the waking world, or whatever it is that you're clearly not in, is perhaps the first real lifeline the game has thrown you in finding a way out of your current predicament, instead of just a chance to find out more about why you're stuck here. Dr. Blight has a fun wrench to throw at you here. In a horror game trope that's pretty common, he shuts down the elevator with you inside of it to starve to death. In a twist, it's Tanya who gets you out. She seems to be doing fine moving around multiple floors and vents without opposable thumbs. She's also a good reminder that the game isn't always going to take itself so seriously. Come on, let's go. As if all this wasn't enough, you gotta get stuck in the vents. Ibi Kaye. Merging on the first floor, we can finally access the door to our last patient's house, Lucas Cole. Based on the fact that it's Lucas who stuck the gun parts around Desmond's building, and that his home is full of army gear and equipment, combined with how he snuck into Meyer Pharmaceuticals to search for the truth about Agent Rainbow, Lucas clearly has quite a bit of the PTSD-afflicted paranoid army vet about him. 
This being 97 and judging by his decor, it would put his time in the military squarely during the Vietnam War. It's off. With his tape in hand, there's a sense that it might actually be time to find out exactly what's going on around here. This final tape is the most Twin Peaks, Alan Wake influenced location of them all. Sprawling by the standards of the past three tapes, this section of Milton Haven is dominated by a giant radio dish, and while the level's progression is still reasonably linear, there are enough side paths and secrets to find that it really felt like this was a very close echo of the game's original open world design. Even if the level hadn't been the biggest in the game, this is also the most ambitious one by far. This is where the final curtains are drawn back on Agent Rainbow, and it's not done in a locked side room that will only be opened by the Determined. No, the entire structure of this level is built around unlocking a massive bunker under the radio dish, and inside the bunker are records and recordings that give concrete answers to many of the questions the game has been posing. First though, you'll need to stay out of the crosshairs of Lucas Cole, here envisioned as the Flash. If the color scheme of the Homa Mart was purple, the lighthouse red, the quarry orange, then it's pretty apparent that this last tape is going to be green. With this new color scheme comes a new choice by the devs. Where every patient is teased or held back to build dramatic tension, the flash is shown to you in the first few moments of your arrival. The design of the flash once again surpasses the expectations set up by the previous levels. Another strong echo of Half-Life 2 for me, this towering hunter gave me the most trouble out of any of Desmond's patients. Part radio tower, part sniper in a ghillie suit, part giant searchlight, this darker side of Lucas gives you very few places to hide. And just like the past patients, you have to use him to help you advance, hiding behind barriers that he can destroy with his massive rifle. You find your last new item soon after seeing the Flash for the first time, in a small cabin Lucas was inhabiting after his arrival to Milton Haven. This radio device is essentially a remote control that lets you activate electronic switches from a distance, a way to activate power relays to channel electricity to shut off devices, and a detection device of sorts for anything that it might be used on. Get within range of a device that you can trigger, and the radio will let out a warning chirp. It's a nifty little gadget, even if its usefulness is somewhat curtailed by its introduction right near the end of the game. I will admit that this is likely a somewhat even split in responsibility between me and the devs, but after obtaining the prototype radio, I never once thought to try using it against the Flash. Perhaps this was because the bull would only ever be distracted by the lure pills, or because there was never a moment where the game forced me to use the radio offensively in order to progress. But I spent the entirety of this level simply running away. This both elevated and leached away the fear of the Flash, as I felt helpless against his attacks, but also in all the running I did from it, the constant stomping of it as it was right on my heels began to make it more of an annoyance than a terror. I wasn't even sure I could use the radio defensively until I took a look at the achievements. Once the possibility was confirmed, I revisited the level on a subsequent playthrough and figured out how to do it but definitely felt that it was my previous experience with the level and a determination to succeed in stunning the Flash that led to my success, rather than anything prompted by the level itself. With the last patient item finally collected, it's time to get to work unlocking the bunker. There are four numbers to uncover, and many different objectives to complete in order to discover what they are. As I mentioned, this is by far the largest level, and while the progression of moving from number to number is actually quite linear, once done with an area, you can always come back to find hidden items you've missed and search for secrets. Of special note here are hidden campsites that uncover pieces of Lucas's tale of being exposed to Agent Rainbow during the Vietnam War and killing a squad mate while under his influence, while also serving as an origin story of sorts for the substance. It adds more pieces to the puzzle and gives you more dialogue from Lucas than you get from any other patient. Since he's the only one who seems to be not dead or in a coma, th this makes sense. Mixed in with the code locations and flash encounters are moments where you encounter lines of rifles planted in the ground with helmets placed on top. These always precede a sort of surreal flashback to the war for you to navigate. You'll need to take cover, dance through minefields, and in the most memorable instance, puzzle your way out of a visitor center that's under fire and filling with toxic smoke. The code locations are the real focus of the level. These in particular are as close as In Sound Mind ever gets to being a pure horror game. 
The first is a water treatment facility that's absolutely inundated with ancient rainbow. The standout here was Augustus Gloop dropping you into the bowels of the facility to navigate a winding maze of rainbow-saturated corridors, all to unlock a set of doors that spit you out just a few feet away from where you started. The second is a cable car ride to a fire tower that puts you firmly in the sights of the Flash. I like this sequence quite a bit. Since your movement is so restricted, you're forced to think on your feet to find the best way forward that won't get you blown to bits. Third is a church, and the atmosphere here is wonderfully oppressive and unsettling. Before you even go inside, there's a vision of Milton Haven being consumed in nuclear fire. There's a lot here that doesn't fit in the typical mold of Zarm's attempts to spook you. Disappearing doors, rattling coffins, shadowy figures that slowly walk towards you, and a large graveyard out back all did a wonderful job of keeping me off balance. The graveyard and the crypt behind the church are also a source of serious plot revelations. The smaller of these is a grave with a cat collar on it. Poor Tanya. The other is a much larger burial plot with no headstone that leads to our most substantial interaction with the Angel, who is clearly the agent rainbow researcher Rosemary. Interred here, she has been reaching out to you at the point of each code number, and her interactions with you here and in the crypt below are vital to understanding the backdrop that helped lead to Desmond's plight. After playing several horror tropes very straight in earlier parts of this level, another of my favorite subversions comes into the end of the crypt. Stuck underground and not sure of how much more you'll have to endure, you come upon what seems like a way out, only for verminous scum to shut you in. In a side room, you locate another generator, of the type that Desmond has become very familiar with over the course of the game. Usually, there's slots for three fuses here. Now, there's nine. It seems like a long slog of a puzzle is ahead of you, until it isn't. It's a fuse box. Fantastic. Something else that's fantastic is the view from the top of the tower after you exit the crypt. I've mentioned that you can see the landmarks of several of the levels to come from the roof of Desmond's building, but that might not be a place that players have gone back to after they first discovered it. Here, the other locations are obvious. The spike of the lighthouse and the darkened silhouettes of the city really help to ground your sense of space. This is another place where I feel the influence of the earlier designs on an open world game. I've also always been a fan of games that actually let you go to all the places you can see in the skybox. It's one of the reasons I hold the Soulsborne series so close to my heart. Seeing that design philosophy carried out here in a linear, level-based game in not just one, but several areas, is well worth praising. You now have the full code to the bunker screaming its message across the sky. Inside is the last big expo dump of notes from Rosemary on Agent Rainbow and its development. Apparently, the debilitating fear that pushed all of your patients off a cliff is just a side effect of a much more potent, potential expanding compound. Apparently, there is such a thing as the collective unconscious, a metaphysical store of knowledge that all humans are connected to. It seems that this knowledge base is why people know things without having been taught, like how babies know how to hold their breath so they won't drown. People exposed to Agent Rainbow have experienced other people's lives, thoughts, emotions, turning them into walking radio transmitters, a kind of human-based internet. Rosemary knows it can be enough to drive anyone out of their minds. Managed correctly, it could become a new frontier for human existence, but Rosemary knows that Meyer Pharmaceutical are almost certainly the wrong hands to hold this kind of power. Yair told me that they kept Rosemary's story much more opaque on purpose, but based on what's here, I admire what we learn about her bravery and sense of morality, even if it likely got her killed. Now, it's finally time to deal with the Flash. Ascending to the top of the radio tower, you use the giant dish to track and fire on a circling Lucas, rejecting and overcoming his deepest fears and regrets, to banish the Flash and finally make contact with the outside world. Help, it seems, might finally be on the way.
Lucas knew there was more to this than meets the eye. I need to make contact with him. Is there anybody out there? Hello? Lucas Cole, if you can hear me, this is Desmond Wales. Do you read? Hanging in there, but I could use your help. Can you get to my office? <laughs> I read you loud and clear, brother. Help is on the way. Are you done exploring the building? Any final secrets left or pills to uncover? Hopefully there's not too much left for you to do, because there's one final tape waiting for you, and the voice on the other end of the phone seems eager to finally have his way with you. In doing one final sweep before confronting the man behind the yellow curtain, there's a last bit of Metroid-style gameplay I want to mention. Once you've finished each patient's tape, you can take the item you gained and head back to their rooms. With the items you've acquired, you can access extra spaces inside and find some more character details, and eventually a record that can be taken back to Desmond's office and played on his turntable. Yair wrote the lyrics for these songs, and we discussed the process of writing songs that would work not just as good lyrics, but also be another window into the characters he was writing. There are some decent songs here, including Virginia's, which was performed by her voice actor. I'm fond of Lucas's track. Me and the boys, we got plans for what comes later after the war. The names for our band and jobs for each other. Although to me, the clear standout belongs to the main character. One final time, Desmond loads in a tape. This time, the room doesn't shift, the building doesn't rumble to some unknown place. Here, a door opens. Through this door, your enemy sits, continuing his flair for the darkly dramatic, crooning a ballad to commemorate your impending demise. Then, one final reveal as the last battle begins. Not this time. There's probably not much surprise in the reveal of our villain's true identity to anyone who's been paying attention to the clues the game has been laying out. Agent Rainbow, like the Watcher, Shade, Bull, and Flash before him, is the manifestation of the worst parts of Desmond his fears, his doubts, his darkest impulses. It helps to explain why Rainbow knows so much about him and is able to follow him wherever he goes. Rainbow's intent was to push Desmond to the breaking point, then consume him, body and soul. But being the worst parts of Desmond, he likely couldn't see that forcing Desmond to confront his patients and let him help them and learn about the true nature of what's happening to him has really only made Desmond stronger. Desmond has come here armed with the knowledge that the deaths of his patients wasn't truly his fault, and whatever his personal failings, he did not truly fail them. This final fight is the most combat-heavy section of the game. I understand the want to make the climax exciting and tense, but I do wish that there had been another moment or two of puzzle solving since the game has done such a good job with its puzzles so far. 
I will say that I was very happy to see one last appearance from my favorite gang of mannequins, there to give you one last bit of encouragement. In any case, inkblots swarm you, barrels rain down from the sky and explode all around, and the giant manifestation of Angel Rainbow continues his river of taunts, while raining blows down at Desmond. To defeat him, you have to place each patient's tape in a player, and then finish him off with his own. Don't forget the attempt at sounding cool, Desmond. I'm afraid our time is up. The next time you want to talk to me, make an appointment. Rainbow finally defeated, Desmond checks in with Tanya, who gives him the key to his room, which was the place you found your first tape. Here, the full extent of Desmond's damage is laid out. Tanya's death turns out to have been due to Desmond's ignorance of a specific plant that could harm her. And there was a partner or wife who left him because of his inability to focus on himself at the expense of his patients. I personally wish we'd learned a bit more about Desmond earlier in the game. The revelation of his partner really seems to have come out at the 11th hour. Rainbow taunts you about her during his boss fight, and at first I thought he was talking about Tanya. Still, these revelations are appreciated, belated though they are. To finish your journey, you go to the roof for one last talk with Tanya. She forgives you for her death and thanks you for taking care of her. Rainbow makes one last appearance too, and his speech about defeating him being the battle of a lifetime was one that really resonated with me. In our interview, Yair talked about his own journey with therapy, and I certainly have benefited immensely from having someone to talk to myself. I feel like anyone who's gone through the same would be able to recognize that if there are things about yourself that you struggle with, you don't just defeat them once and move on. It's all about learning about yourself, about your patterns and tendencies, and building strategies for taking positive steps in your life. That too is very important to me. I feel like it's not the big sweeping gesture that helps you change, it's the small, fundamental shifts that help to really make an impact. There were several mental health experts credited in helping with the game, and I definitely felt their impact here. I'm so glad that this game overcame its first impressions. While not a AAA title, In Sound Mind was clearly made by a team that was passionate and dedicated, and their hard work paid off. In art direction alone, I think the game punches above its weight, and the thoughtful design of the town and characters add a lot to really ground Milton Haven as a plausible place. While combat was serviceable, it was the puzzle and environmental design that's going to stick with me the longest. I have to admit that the central mystery of what happened to Desmond wasn't the greatest pull for me in the game, and in a lot of ways it was my second playthrough that was more enjoyable from a story perspective, since I had a much better understanding of the conspiracy and who all the characters were and their relation to each other. In terms of horror, outside of the early game where I didn't have a good grasp of what the game would throw at me, and the standout examples that I've mentioned before, I don't think I was ever much more than creeped out by In Sound Mind. My delight at the design of the bull in particular comes to mind. Here's this giant aggressive beast, and my first thought was, oh, that's so cool! This part of things is always going to be much more subjective than many other aspects of the game, but that's where it landed for me. In Sound Mind may have been outside of my usual preferences, but that didn't stop it from really winning me over. It was an incredibly solid experience with quite a few high points and very few lows. After the credits, there's a stinger where Lucas finds Desmond in the waking world and vows to protect him. Meyer Pharmaceutical and those responsible for all this pain are still out there and they need to be exposed. Quite the seed planted for a potential sequel. Yair knows what the title will be if the team ever gets to make one, and I for one would love to see where things might go. Just as long as my crack squad of mannequins can come along for the ride. In Sound Mind is available on the Nintendo Switch, PC, Xbox Series X and Series S, and the PlayStation 5. Play it in a dark room with some headphones on, and enjoy the ride. Thanks so much for watching to the end of the video. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know it's been a while. Uh, it's been, gosh, six, seven months since my last vid and uh, longer than that since the Dishonored video came out. Um, 
I have to admit the success of the Dishonored video uh, when it happened caught me a little flat-footed. I was uh, pretty unprepared. Um, so, uh, my writing and editing and all that stuff kind of took a little while to catch up, but we're in a bit of a groove now. Um, I really wanted to make sure this one was, was well done because of the interview that I got with the main writer, uh, Yair Bandor. Uh, you'll see a few clips from that interview uh, after this. I'm really excited for you to see it. Um, the full interview will be going up in a few weeks. I'll make sure to post a link to that uh, either in the comments or in the description down below. Um, it was a really great interview. I can't thank him enough for agreeing to sit down for it. Um, and I think that it is very illuminating in terms of some of the background stuff that, that went into making the game. I also want to thank my Patreon subscriber, Simon, for helping to replace my old mic uh, windscreen. Uh, as you can see, the new one is very impressive, and I think it's really doing its job well. So thank you so much, Simon. Uh, and I want to thank you for watching. Um, I'm excited to be back with more content, and there will be more content fast in the future. Um, if you like this video, please consider subscribing, giving it a like, sharing it around. Uh, I would love to be able to do more of these more often. Uh, so please consider taking a look at my Patreon page or uh, throwing me some money on coffee. But um, really, as, as always, your views are more than enough. See you in the next one. Basic layout of the game. Now, when, when I joined... In Sound Mind, it was still supposed to be in a non-linear open world oh, game, okay. horror right. game. Right. And so many things have changed, and we'd had to, we'd had to overhaul the whole idea of the game and the story several right. times. Okay. So even though there were a few times where we were like scratch everything, we have to start from the beginning. The a lot of the base writing was still there, and we stuck to a lot of the ideas that we wanted to. Okay. So, for instance, some of the characters' names were there already. I didn't change them. There was a lot of stuff I didn't feel like I needed to change because it was great. Sam okay. did a phenomenal job when he handed it over to me. Cool. Um, and then I took over, and then there was a million things that were done and were changed before I got Daniel Kane to come in and help me uh, because I needed help. There was so much to do in so little time. And things were changing. We went from having ten different... Ten monsters in the game. Oh, wow. Ten cut bosses down wow. okay. cut down to, I think it went from ten to eight to five to four. Mm -hmm. And I needed to, every time we cut the story down, I needed to fit the story into less chapters. Interesting. Yeah, because, um, I mean, you still had that huge... Yeah, because it was a huge thing. And right. And, all that. Yeah. Yeah. and so there's a lot of reasons behind why the game ends the way it does and, you know teases what comes next maybe and stuff and that's that's part of it is because we had originally this gigantic thing that was very ambitious of right. us uh and we had to just kind of squeeze it down to to uh, you know 10 to 12 hours of gameplay mostly successfully yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what kind of thinking went into some of the specifics of like the the time and the place because uh, i mean you're you're still a little vague about certain things but i, I feel like i remember eventually settling it was like the mid mid 90s yeah it's, it's kind of mid to late 90s and, and um part of the reason we wanted to do that is because we're all 90s kids right um and um and so we grew up playing the 90s and early 2000s games too and in sound mind was built to feel like an early 2000s FPS, okay. kind of. Like, yeah. you know, like, Half-Life is a huge inspiration, right? It's kind of meant to feel like an old-school game. And as such, we, we didn't want it to be a modern... The story to take place in modern times. We wanted it to feel like something from our childhood. Mm -hmm. So, cassette tapes and lack of cell phones. Um, uh, you know, the, the music is uh, different thing because we have tombstone in it but he took a lot of inspiration from that too um and basically we just wanted to, to kind of tap into our own you know things that we hold sacred uh from our childhoods right. um 
Um, yeah. You mentioned Half Life. What are some of the other inspirations that you have? I mean, I, I personally like I felt some echoings of Alan Wake. Sure. Uh, you know, like some Twin Peaks is in there. Yes, X-Files, all, all of that stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I think one of their reviewers said something which was great, and it was, it was as if an episode of X Files and Twin Peaks happened simultaneously. Would be uh, our game. Uh, all of those things are true. Uh, 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 Half Life was a huge huge inspiration but also like you know hor- horror games but not even just like horror games like fear and soma um but also just like narrative games like undertale okay and um i mean look every single person in the dev team we don't all play the same games uh and we all take inspiration from other games alan wake it's really funny because I didn't play Alan Wake until well after writing chapter two. Wow, okay. And that's Alan's chapter. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a lot of similarities in there that I... Seriously, I swear this is true. Never... I haven't played Alan Wake until after we built that level. And then I played Alan Wake and I was like, oh no, <laughs> what the f***? Like, I'm going to get in so much trouble and people going to... And, uh... So one of the things that I um, picked up on as this, uh, I played through the game, was the fact that there are a lot of seeds dropped for later chapters or, you know, the kind of the, the governmental conspiracy part of things. Um, how, did, how did you go about planning that out and balancing how much information to, to give when? That's a very good question. We were doing that until right up until release. Okay. Uh, we were still doing that uh, sort of uh, information... Um, a balance in in how much information we give the player because um, again we went from having a story that was supposed to fit ten chapters down to four right and that was a huge undertaking and it was tough and a lot of stuff was cut out and we had to decide what information is important to the story and what is not and uh Right up until the very end, we said there's too much information here, and we made decisions to make intentional plot holes, Okay. Um, which means that there's just enough information for you to get a sense of the story, and a lot of stuff that is intentionally unexplained, uh, because we wanted A, people to theorize, uh, but B, because uh, uh, it can be explained in in a later time right if we ever get the opportunity to write a continuation to in sound mind uh, uh a lot of information will be uh well it, like there's there's a lot of stuff will that maybe previously didn't make sense will uh but i think we did a really good job in the sense that like things do make sense in the in the grand scheme if you if you're you know this it's a psychological horror there's a lot of sci-fi elements too. There's a lot of suspension of disbelief. There's the, the you know, it's it's not perfect science, kids. <laughs> um, but uh, but but I think we do okay. And 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 a lot of the intentional plot holes uh, were are very much intentional. Okay. Um, some things are you're not meant to know. Now, I do enjoy the occasional horror game. I played several Fatal Frames. Fatal Frame 2 is easily the scariest game I've ever... Now, I do enjoy the occasional horror game. I played several Fatal Frames. Fatal Frame 2 is easily the scariest game I've ever personally beaten. And that was in a dark room with friends, so the ghost had someone else to kill while I could dive out a window. I hold Resident Evil 4 up in my all-time this f***ing motorcycle out my window. I am going... I am going to put a tier on my Patreon that is specifically to fund the purchase of like a tripwire or a rocket propelled grenade and I'm going to deal with these stupid, hmm, it's fine, it's fine, we're cool. The early rooms you explore are all pretty nondescript as well. Dank basement areas with a sense of nondescriptness that doesn't leave a strong sense of place. 
There's a few easy puzzles to solve to ease you into some of what the game is expecting from you, and your first encounter with one of the game's primary any type, enemy, enemy, anemones, yes, yes, see, see anemones are going to come at you and, and attack you, and it's just, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Probably the most consistent clue is the constant messages, phone calls, and appearances from the yellow trench coat wearing boogeyman with the melted face. While he looks like the man with the yellow hat from Curious George after a dunk in an ace chemical vat, he's got a showman's flair for the dramatic. Really? I'm talking here. You're not completely safe back here, however. There are some ink blot monsters, and the man in the yellow coat is still dogging your every step. As I mentioned before, the phone calls you've been getting from him are clearly the work of someone who's enjoying the chance to taunt and threaten you, and his blink and you'll miss them appearances have certainly added to the sense that he's always watching you. I have to add my own personal thanks that when the devs finally have him full, full, full a pull, full a pull, full a pull, fantastic. The shade pulls out all the stops. I'm gonna sneeze. Am I gonna? Uh, no. Yes. Yeah. Dang it. Ugh. <coughs> Ugh.